Look, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker from APACRS. So we selected our talks and what we thought were the most interesting from our last conference. And this certainly catches the eye. It's new technology, but it's, it's not expensive. And uh, I'd like to introduce Suvan Batiji, who will tell us about Batiji Rings, the next generation pupil expansion device. Thank you, Suvan. Thank you for this kind and patient. Good morning, everybody. It's indeed my privilege to represent the Asia-Pacific Association of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons. I have a financial interest in terms of pending patent applications. It doesn't advance. Can you advance the slide, please? Yeah. There we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I'll be talking about the next-gen people dilating devices, and this has essentially notches and flanges and can expand the pupil with a single 0.9 or 20-gauge incision. Isaac Newton said, I have seen a little further. It's by standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm sorry about that. And let's look at the giants who paved the way for me and my work. 1979, Alan Schenk had the first handheld iris retractor and pupil dilator. The first flexible pupil expansion ring, in fact, came way back in 1981 by Robert Glass. Sorry. And the first self-retaining metal uh, and flexible iris retractors came by McQuinn, Sai, Higginbotham, and Dijuan, 1989 to 91. It'll be coming come as a surprise to most cataract surgeons that the first Flexible iris retractors, in fact, were used by the retinal surgeons and not the cataract surgeons. And this was way back in 1991. This is a publication in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. As you can see over here, Dijuan and Higginbotham in 1991 published their work with what we have been using as flexible iris retractors for a long time. It's only in 92 and 93 we had work from Richard McCule and Louis Chamin. Then came the era of People expansion rings, Grather, Milverton, Lee, Marcher, but none of them really stood the test of time. These were very brave attempts and in read a different line of thinking. And then there was a paradigm shift in our thinking about small people. It was redefined by Chang and Campbell. All of us saw it as cataract surgeons, but they are the ones who meaningfully interpreted it. 2007 saw the birth of an idea, a brilliant idea, in fact, by Boris Malugin. This was a strand of polypropylene with scrolls, a truly disruptive innovation, and that got me thinking way back. My target was a 20-gauge incision. I thought I could make it simpler, but didn't know how. There was a gut feeling I, I felt I could do it. And if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And it took me two full years to figure out what exactly was possibly wrong, and how could I probably go about the problem? The scrolls are brilliant, there's no denying that. Yet, that seemed to be the biggest hurdle in my path for the 20 gauge incision. The two plane design is what catches the incision lip and the inserter and makes it difficult. I drew my inspiration from the iris hooks and the mulligan ring, and was born the next gen pupil expansion ring. This happy wedlock between the iris hooks and the mulligan ring led to the notches and flanges with alternate flanges being behind the iris. We had the square and the hexagon which dilated the pupil very well. Works very much like the paper clip. The device remains in a single plane like the paper clip and the iris bends very much like the paper. So we have the butter charge rings. 5-0 nylon, 0.1 mm profile, extremely fl flexible, slim joint, comes as a hexagon and as a square. The notches straighten as they pass through a single 20 gauge incision. The leading flange is tucked under the iris. The trailing second and third flanges may be tucked using a Kuglin hook or specially designed forceps and we have a wonderfully dilated hexagon. Alternately, we could use a 23 gauge forceps to unimanually tuck the flange or use a bimanual technique with an iris hook. This is a bimanual emisis in progress, and you can see the stable device. This is a coaxial phaco, a wound-assisted eyewell implantation. As you can see, there is no hindrance to the process, and that's how we measure the size of the opening. And this is a pretty hard cataract using a hexagon device. 
we measured the capsular excess and the pupil excess. And removal of a device has never been easier. You just hold a flange, disengage two notches, and you just drag out the device and it comes out. The device maintains its integrity, and we have a wonderfully round pupil, suggesting the atraumatic nature of the engagement. And this is a 2.2 incision. It's really a walk in the park. It just takes the device through, and that's the leading flange, which goes under the pupil margin. And the trailing flanges could be tucked using the side port incisions. You do need to have a couple of passes, extra passes, but it's pr pretty easy to do that. And you have a well-expanded pupil. And as I said, removal has never been so easy. You just need to hold a flange and drag out the device. The trailing notches actually disengage spontaneously. You have a wonderful round pupil. This is a one millimeter incision, and you can see it's a 1.5 pupil probably as we, and, and the device goes. And this is especially designed for forceps, which has a wider jaw, which helps in, I mean, uh, engaging all the flanges through that single one millimeter incision. That's the leading flange, and that's the second flange, which goes in under the pupil margin, and this would be the third flange, all through that single one millimeter incision. And we have a hexagonal pupil, which serves our purpose very well. And the atraumatic engagement of the notches is what allows us to rotate the ring, which has not been possible with any device in the past. We can hold that flange over there and see the amount of rotation that this ring allows. And there we go and tuck in that last flange. And that's necessary when we're using a single uh, incision for expansion of the pupil. So uses other than standard FACO would be, I think the greatest use is femtoid-assisted small pupil FACO, where you could use a 0.9 or a 20 gauge incision to expand the pupil and then go ahead and create the incisions and do the rest of the surgery. You are actually using femto to its best. By manual coaxial MICS, which has not been possible with the existing pupil expansion devices, shallow anterior chambers, and small pupil vitreous surgery. Now, in femto assisted fake small people, FACO, like I said, a smaller, smaller, a single smaller side port incision would allow superior quality incisions, which could be femto laser generated, reduce the risk of infection and inflammation, and reduce the risk of AC shelling during imaging and laser treatment. By manual or coaxial MICS, as we know, uses incisions 2 millimeters and 1.5 millimeters, respectively. And the mulligan ring requires at least a 2.2 incision, so we really don't have a device for bimanual coaxial MICS. The mulligan ring strand is thicker, and the vertical profile is a lot higher. So in a shallow anterior chamber where the perif mid peripheral anterior chamber depth is where the corners are located, it could be a touch and go situation, and a thinner profile device would definitely be a big advantage. Microincision vitreous surgery, a 2.2 corneal incision to just expand the pupil is probably undesirable and self-defeating. These are the results with the square device around pupil at the end of seventh day. This, and this is the hexagonal device. We have another round pupil. And this was very gratifying. The other eye was blind due to angle closure glaucoma. In this eye, we had a peripheral iridectomy done 20 years back. The anterior chamber depth was 1.72 millimeters used one of the hexagonal devices, and on day seven we had unaided 2030 and a round pupil. I published my work in JCRS in the July issue last year, and I was fortunate that it remained the most read paper for the greater part of 2014, more than six months it was the most read paper. These are some interesting cases, recurrent uveitis, posterior sinecchi, and pupil prepropriary membrane. After removing the pupil pupil membrane, the pupil didn't expand enough to allow phaco surgery. So we went ahead and used a square device, and we had an adequate expansion to go ahead. Here we had a, a, a meiosis after capsulorexis, and we could use an expansion device without cap, actually engaging the capsulorexis margin. And this was the eye which I was talking about, the shallow anterior chamber, and we used a hexagonal device. This is a one-eyed patient, and actually this ring was really very rewarding. We had excellent results. And that's how we removed the device at the end of the surgery. This was a very shallow antechamber. We had no endothelial touch throughout the surgery. Sorry. This is an adherent leucoma, <coughs> small pupil, hard cataract, probably the acid test for this device. This is a pre op dilated pupil. You have a sinecure over there, a short eye a central anterior chamber depth of one millimeter, a mid peripheral anterior chamber depth of 1.5, a lopsided situation, a tricky situation. I was wondering which device to use to expand the pupil. We had big trouble, I, and 
a malignant ring would probably get stuck in the scar and there would be an endothelial touch and that would make things complicated. We used one of the hexagonal devices and the short anterior chamber, restricted anterior chamber, did not allow the entire device to be placed in the anterior chamber. So we used helon to uh, make space over there and we let that leading flange go in over there and then tuck that leading flange under the scar and the iris margin and we had, that was straddling the scar over there and that was the second flange this was a pretty hard mature cataract, a very challenging situation, and that was the capsular rexus skirting the, uh, the pupil margin, and we measured it, the pupil uh, measured to six by five millimeters, which was very, uh, quite adequate for our FACO, and so this being a hard cataract, we chopped up the, uh, the cat nucleus into as small fragments as possible to avoid any zonular stress and uh, instability, and once we were done with the chopping, the, there was no, no difficulty in phaco emulsification due to the. We had evidence of IFIS over here with the iris prolapse. We didn't bother about it at that point. And we went ahead and removed the device. As I said, removal hasn't been easier with the pupil expansion device this far. I mean, as easy as this. And this is a 20 gauge side port. I always prefer to this, use the side port. It's a lot more controlled. We reposited the uh, knuckle of iris over there and we had a nice round pupil on day seven, as round as it possibly could get in the given circumstances. The present status is I have a pending patent in US, PCT and India. Not yet commercially available. I'm in talks with people but I'm still open to offers from device manufacturers. I want to make it as widely available as possible. Each piece is still manufactured confidentially by me. It takes average about one hour a piece which is a really tall order given that I have to work as an ophthalmologist for the rest of the week as well. Global trials are on. Uh, it's been used in five centers. I've had very good feedback from personal communications, five centers in Europe, three in India. It's been used for femtofaco, MICS, and standard FACO. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. It's indeed a privilege to represent APAC others. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Bill. I think very clever. Congratulations. Thank you. Have you ever had one of these go into the posterior chamber during a procedure? And if, and if it does, how do you take them out? No, fortunately not. And uh, fortunately, I'm a retinal surgeon as well. So uh, though I haven't, had an, I haven't had an open posterior capsule at all, so they don't, I haven't had an issue. But yes, it, this would drop into the posterior, into the vitreous if it, if it were, and it would require a vitreous surgery. If you're, if you're talking of the posterior chamber in the sense of behind the iris, or are you talking of the... Just behind the iris, as you're doing well, we your procedure. Can, oh, we can always bring it out. We can, that's, okay. it's, it's happened. A, a flange has gone behind, uh, uh, unlike what we had planned out, and it, it's, it's easier to get it out. It's pretty easy. You can use the iris hook and just draw really? the iris over there and get it out. Your hexagonal device gives a really round pupil. What would be the indication for the square? Device. Well, it's a personal preference. I personally, uh, of the trials, actually, I was talking to some of the surgeons yesterday. Uh, there are two, one in Europe, in fact, Jorge Alio prefers a square, and uh, Ron prefers a square, and I use a hexagon. Most of the surgeons, uh, if you look at the geometry, the hexagon <coughs> is actually geometrically better, because for a given uh, uh, size, uh, let's say a 6.5 square and a 6.5 hexagon, a hexagon would give a larger pupil. Yes, yeah. So that way, geometrically, it uh, makes more sense, the hexagon. Uh, Suvin, um, it's, it's excellent, and I can see the advantage for small incisions. But just looking at the sequence of inserting it, it seems that the Malugan would be more maybe two steps in and the upper scroll, that seems to take a few more steps to insert. Yes, the, that's because I showed the hexagon more often, that's my personal preference, but if it was a square, it's probably just two steps. Just it's one flange less. I also have a comment. Any damage for uh, irises that are atrophic or subatrophic? No, Because no. this is very thin thread. No, 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 I have not had any issue with the iris uh, atrophy or pigment dispersion. I did have an iatrogenic uh, I did an analysis that was way back in the beginning because I held the uh, people margin instead of the device and I dragged it. That was iatrogenic and I've reported that in the JCRS, but that's all is the complication I had. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.